Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Current, the North Central Region Water Network's Speed Networking Webinar Series. I am Rebecca Power, and I'm uh, joining you from the University of Wisconsin, and I will be your moderator for today. Since some of you may be new to the North Central Region Water Network, we are an extension-led collaboration among land-grant universities and our partners in 12 upper Midwestern states, and we uh, uh, try to bring you great information on all kinds of uh, different water issues. Today's topic is successful efforts to stop aquatic invasive species uh, from the pet and pond trades. And uh, before we introduce our presenters, uh, I just want to go over some of the, the ground rules for the session. So we uh, welcome you all to submit your questions for presenters in the chat box. The chat box is accessible uh, through the purple Collaborate panel, which is in the lower right corner of your screen. Uh, and we'll have a dedicated Q&A session after uh, the presenters are through. Uh, we try to maintain at least 20 minutes for Q&A. We welcome your discussion. We know there's a lot of uh, great information and great expertise uh, in our participants as well as with the people presenting. So we, we look forward to that Q&A session at the end. Um, a phone option for Collaborate is also uh, available. It can be accessed by opening the session menu, which is in the upper left-hand area of the webinar screen. And you can uh, there select use phone for audio and uh, uh, call in that way. These sessions are recorded. They are available uh, either for you or for your colleagues that weren't able to make it today, uh, either at northcentralwater.org um, or learn.eextension.org. So today, today's presenters, uh, we are uh, excited to welcome Doug Jensen from the University of Minnesota Sea Grant and Tim Campbell from the University of Wisconsin Extension. They're going to be talking about the Habitatitude program and its implementation in Minnesota and Wisconsin. We also welcome Paige Felice from Michigan State University Extension, uh, and she's going to be talking about the Ripple program. And then finally, Greg Hitzroth from Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, uh, he is going to be talking about organisms in trade outreach, uh, organisms in trade outreach in Illinois and Indiana. That said, let's get on with the program. So welcome again to, to Doug Jensen and Tim Campbell. You can see a little bit about them in their bios there. Um, the purpose of this webinar series, you know, we try to give you just a, a, a tease of information about each of these programs and uh, introduce you to folks like Doug and Tim so you know who they are and, and what they have to offer um, in this arena across the North Central region. And then you can uh, feel free to follow up with them uh, individually uh, if you want more information about their programs. So with that, welcome Doug and Tim. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate everybody uh, uh, taking some time this afternoon to join us. So I would like to thank the webinar organizers. Uh, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Awesome. I uh, would also like to uh, thank the uh, North Central Regional Water Network and uh, again to all of you that joined us today. Um, we have some really good news um, from uh, this area of the country and this neck of the woods that the Habitat Attitude campaign really remains alive and well in the Great Lakes region. As many of you know, the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network led by Minnesota and many are, of our partners have been actively promoting um, Habitat Attitude prevention messages, most recently thanks to funding through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative that uh, has helped to re revitalize the campaign uh, beginning back in 2010. Uh, for today's uh, uh, webinar, Tim and I are going to cover what, how we've taken the Habitat to campaign in a unique direction uh, recently by forming new partnerships, uh, which hold events to rehome unwanted fish, uh, pet fish, invertebrates, uh, plants, and even reptiles. And now I'm going to see if I can advance the slide. Aha, it worked. Great. So, um, the problem is that we continue to discover organisms in trade in our north central region waterways, uh, some of which that can be highly event, uh, invasive. And shown here are prana, water lettuce, water hyacinth, blue stripe, Amazonian catfish there on the left uh, center, 
uh, Brazilian Elodea, Northern Snakehead, Goldfish, Hydrilla Koi, Yellow Iris, and Paku, uh, just to highlight a few. And, and while some of these will not likely survive in our northern waters, others can certainly flourish and cause impacts. Um, and through our work uh, through the Habitat to campaign, what we've learned is that a vast majority of consumers who are releasing these pets don't understand the consequences of their actions and want to do the right thing. But uh, once they understand the consequences of their actions, they're less likely to release unwanted pets and plants um, into the environment. We suspect that many of you have heard about uh, Habitattitude in one way, shape, or form. Uh, for those of you that are not aware, Habitattitude was launched in 2004 as a national education, national education campaign uh, created by a unique partnership of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, and NOAA Sea Grant, uh, led by Minnesota. And at its core, uh, the campaign provides opportunities from the pet industry to consumers to be part of the solution to unwanted animal and pet release. Um, at its launch, we had major support from all sectors of the pet industry, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, a grant from NOAA Sea Grant. We had huge momentum going on until about 2007 until the funding ran out. Then the campaign languished for a couple of years until it was jump-started regionally based on funding through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative grants Four initiatives which were led by uh, Minnesota Sea Grant, another one that was led by Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. So reinvigorated in 2010, the upshot of all this is that we had our, our, our partners generated over 3.5 million impressions through conferences, meetings, workshops, uh, talks, booths, youth events, teacher trainings, and mass and social media. And a previous assessment of the campaign helped guide our efforts forward. Uh, we began to reinvigorate our partners. Uh, we knew that based on our past survey results from the campaign, that the campaign can increase awareness, it is acceptable, easy, attractive, and the messages are clear. And importantly, based on exposure to the campaign, 84% of the consumers that we contacted said that they would uh, no longer release unwanted fish and aquatic plants. From 2010 to 2015, post-event surveys conducted by the Great Lakes Sea Grant programs from Minnesota to New York uh, were administered at events following exposure to the Habitat to campaign prevention messages, comparing awareness before and after reported awareness increased 19%, which was statistically significant. We continue to recognize that the direct extension-based outreach based on Habitat attitude can work to raise awareness, but what about changing behaviors? So evidence suggests that we're on the right path uh, with reported behavior change showing an even more dramatic increase from 45% always to usually taking action to 89%, always to usually taking action, 44% increase, which was also statistically significant. So Aquarius and water gardeners have remained receptive to the Habitat to its prevention messages. Probably the most frequently released aquatic pet are goldfish. Uh, release of goldfish are not good uh, for our waterways. Our uh, reasons are that they can overpopulate our native fish, make the water murky when they feed, uh, which can be a game changer for limiting light penetration, harming native plant communities, and depressing dissolved oxygen concentrations that can uh, result in fish kills. A few years back in Duluth, we had this happen um, at, at the University of Minnesota Duluth campus. Several species of fish, including koi and goldfish, overpopulated this pond, which drains into a designated trout stream that flows into Lake Superior. And Minnesota Sea Grant helped the team that uh, drained the pond to save the stream, but at a cost of about $100,000 for both direct and indirect costs. The good news is that we were successful in eradicating the fish from the pond, but this sort of reactive uh, approach is not sustainable. Just last week, the Minnesota DNR blamed release of illegal goldfish that uh, killed common carp in central Minnesota. And the University of Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center reports that the culprit, koi herpes virus, has been found in eight other lakes in Minnesota. Of course, this is an indication that we're dealing with uh, very much an emerging issue. Uh, we've also had many releases of alligators and snakes that have gained attention, like this six-foot alligator that was found in the Snake River back in uh, 2005 here in Minnesota. Gators hiking on trails in Brainerd, Minnesota and even a boa constrictor found on the back deck of a house in Stillwater, Minnesota. Again, these are all signs uh, that education alone may not be enough and that a new approach is needed to prevent such releases. 
So to provide an alternative to such releases, Habitat to Surrender uh, collaborators were formed as a part of a larger regional initiative uh, underway by the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network. Other components of the initiative were to build upon the first Great Lakes Biotic Symposium held in 2000, two uh, 2013 and to host another in 2018 to help advance the understanding of AIS pathway management. And Tim's gonna talk about that in a few moments. Uh, we also um, created a adapt to Habitat to curriculum for grades uh, six through 12, as well as holding uh, teacher day camps that are available to pre uh, prevent live study specimen releases. And the curriculum that is shown here is available uh, by download from the Minnesota Sea Grant website. Uh, we've also created new Habitat to uh, tools that will support outreach efforts to prevent release. And another component is a new Stop Aquatic Hitchhiker Outreach, which will focus specifically on the release of not releasing uh, live uh, bait um, into our area waters. So to date, five Habitat Attitude collaborative networks have been formed uh, involving over 40 partners. The events were marketed through a variety of different media, which we'll show you in a moment. Nine events have educated hundreds of people and excitingly, over well over 500 aquarium fish, invertebrates, plants, and reptiles have been rehomed. Uh, shown here are some examples of the event flyer, poster, event lawn banner, as well as newspaper advertisement. Uh, flyers and posters were distributed in public areas uh, across Duluth uh, previous to our events. Um, ads were placed in local newspaper and event postings were placed on many community event uh, calendars and also social media. And lawn banners like the one that's uh, shown there, uh, second from the right, were placed at uh, major intersections on the day event to attract uh, people to come into the event. So we've had several Habitatitude surrenders in uh, Duluth. Last October, we hosted an event with Animal Allies, Humane Society, and World of Fish, which is a local retailer. Uh, we educated visitors, including 20 junior ally volunteers, um, and we also rehomed a variety of different animals. Our news release and newspaper advertisement generated over a million media exposures, so we feel pretty good about getting the word about word out about the Habitatitude Surrender event. In the Twin Cities, we partnered with the Minnesota Aquarium Society's winter and spring auctions, which they are very supportive of. And uh, based on work by a, a Girl Scout in the Twin Cities area, a successful surrender event was held with the Minnesota Herpetological Society uh, last May. So we reached out to two uh, Duluth area schools as an extension of the Habitatitude Collaborative. Uh, teachers often use live crayfish for teaching curriculum. But after the class is over, the live crayfish sometimes were released by teachers and sent home with students who released them. Over the last two years, the curriculum coordinators in both schools have collected over 46 dozen crayfish from the classrooms. Uh, for the Hermantown uh, school students, students, it became an educational moment on aquatic invasive species. So this is a great opportunity and a win-win-win for everybody. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Tim, who will talk about the partnerships uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin and some of the experiences that he's had um, in uh, Wisconsin and implementing, implementing Habitat to it. Okay, thanks, Doug. And I guess to, I guess, continue on with our Habitat to uh, Surrender Collaborative partners and some of the events we've had, I think that especially in Minnesota and Wisconsin, the success we've had with our surrender events uh, has really been because of all of the partners we've had. Um, and I think with each organization, um, as a any good partnership, uh, there's a lot of common goals. And I think with, uh, especially Wisconsin's events, um, we've been able to really match up the goals of the nonprofits that we're dealing with and working with, with the goals of you know, Wisconsin Sea Grant EW Extension. We're really interested in uh, preventing the spread of aquatic invasive species, uh, you know, aquarium societies and some of the, the pet rescues we work with. This really wasn't an issue that had been on uh, on their radar before, but when we started talking and working together, we you know, really realized that uh, preventing the spread of aquatic invasive species, uh, that the messaging that we would use for that has a lot of overlap with the animal welfare messaging that our nonprofits use. So we really realized that you know the same events and same programs could be used to meet our goals. So you know I think the best example of that for us in Wisconsin is the Fox Valley Habitatitude Surrender Collaborative. And it's a volunteer and nonprofit driven partnership that uses the rehoming events to reduce the spread of invasive species and promote responsible pet ownership. Uh, I'm going to add a few more wins to Doug's comment. 
or Doug's comment, it's win, 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 win. Um, for these nonprofits, when we host events like this, we're bringing a lot of people into the door because they, the nonprofits will bring uh, their own kind of specimens for people to come check out and learn about exotic pet uh, care and, you know, learn about you know, what kind of exotic pets might be good for them. So even people without pets to surrender are coming in to check out these events. But then we're also, uh, through that kind of word of mouth and buzz about the events, getting people to hear about the event and to come in. Um, and to surrender pets because they didn't know what to do with them. So I, I remember, you know, I have a whole bunch of stories from the very first uh, surrender event we did. Uh, people always wanted a resource like this to exist, especially for exotic pets, because uh, humane societies really can't step in uh, and rehome snakes and frogs particularly easily. Uh, aquarium stores aren't super into uh, collecting a lot of unwanted fish and reselling them. That's not super easy to do. And these can't take things because of... Uh, I guess, disease and husbandry issues. So these kind of events really work well. And, you know, in the four years we've been doing these in the Fox Valley, it's really gone to, uh, you know, the organizations themselves are running these events, and I'm kind of on the sidelines these days, helping out with promotion, uh, making connections with uh, media and that kind of stuff. But really, as far as the events go, uh, these guys really love doing them. And it's been a really hands-off thing for me for the past year. So I think it's been a really great approach. Um, for some of the promotion, um, I think Doug had mentioned that he does a lot of newspaper advertising to get people into the door. I've done a lot of Facebook advertising. It does seem that you know, really anything you can do to get the word out about these events, uh, people will mention that that's why they came into the door. We've also done uh, like promotional handouts at pet stores. So you know, any sort of promotion can get these people into the door. I just personally happen to like to use or like the Facebook advertising because uh, it's easy to do from my desk. So um, I don't think we had a ton of time to really dive into some of these issues, the, the speed networking format, but uh, there is a whole day and a half on OIT uh, presentations at the Upper Midwest Invasive Species Conference, the Great Lakes Biotic Symposium, or Great Lakes Briefs on Invasive Organisms Traded in Commerce Symposium. Uh, we had our first event, um, actually it was in 2014, I messed this slide up, pretty much the best conference ever, especially on organisms and trade issues, might have been the first one, so that might not have anything to do with it. Um, but this symposium will be held on Monday afternoon and Tuesday during UMIS in Rochester. Uh, the first day will be cover outreach and the pet surrender events, and specifically uh, how you can get involved in hosting one in your local area. And then on Tuesday, we'll have sessions on uh, risk assessment, regulations, um, control and response. I can never remember them all <laughs> back to back. Uh, we'll have one specific session on bait, and I'll think of the other one by the end. So go to UMIS, go to the Great Lakes Biotic Symposium. You'll learn more, and it will be awesome. And... Okay, so to wrap things up, uh, we've done a lot of stuff. Here's some numbers. They're slightly out of date, uh, thanks to GLRI for allowing us to do these things. Um, really, everything that we've done can be easily adapted for other locations. So if you're not on the Habitatitude train and would like to be, uh, feel free to contact Doug and I. And I'm sure that we can uh, help you adapt some of our work to apply it in your area. So thank you. That's all I have. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, and of course, great, great numbers, great evaluation, uh, great uh, reach in in the Habitatitude program. And thanks to Doug and Tim for sharing it with us. And, and Tim prompts us to think about questions for our presenters. So you can put those in the chat box. And Tim, uh, just to help warm us up, you can also put any of those topics that you missed uh, into the chat box uh, for folks as well. Okay, on to Paige. So uh, Paige Felice again, research assistant, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State University Extension. So uh, welcome Paige and look forward to your presentation. Awesome, great, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, hello everyone and good afternoon. Um, today I'll be presenting information about outreach and research efforts in Michigan to reduce aquarium and pond invasive species. Yeah. All right. And to address this issue in Michigan, um, we created a state specific program. It's called RIPPLE. And RIPPLE stands for Reduce Invasive Pet and Plant Escapes. 
And a unique aspect of this program is that it's truly a collaborative process. Um, while it's primarily coordinated by Michigan State, um, we have very active state agency partners um, and countless pet and garden industry members who really provide support to the program and offer guidance. So in a similar fashion to Habitatitude, you know, we really rely on these on partnering, um, especially with retailers, um, to get our message out. Um, originally, Ripple was um, funded through Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funds um, and began in 2014. Um, but we've since have received um, financial support through state um, invasive species grant funds from our departments of natural resources, environmental quality, and agriculture and rural development. And the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development is really who we've partnered um, most closely with on the program. And to ensure that Ripple is an effective education program for both consumers and retailers, um, the development of it and implementation of the campaign is really driven by research. And we utilize studies of hobbyists to really guide the development process of the program. And we are currently studying retailer behavior in Michigan to ensure our program is effective as possible um, for the future. And one survey in particular of aquarium hobbyists in the Midwest really helped to shape Ripple. Um, it found that consumers really view these retailers as experts and believe retailers should be sharing invasive species information when they're making purchases. Um, but unfortunately, they say they report not learning about invasive species while shopping. And um, the survey also found that Michigan hobbyists had a low awareness of the habitatitude, um, which isn't too surprising because it's not promoted as heavily um, in Michigan as it is um, by our awesome partners in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And this was one reason that we decided to go with a state specific program instead of a national one. Um, another reason is that our retail partners really wanted something that was very Michigan specific and a campaign that they could provide specific guidance on. So we created Ripple. So utilizing these findings from the survey and other pertinent research, we created the Ripple program alongside those agency and retail partners. And like I mentioned earlier, the creation of Ripple was extremely collaborative. And our partners did not feel comfortable with um, having materials that discouraged consumers perhaps from purchasing species that were not regulated by the state. So all of our messaging focuses really on the proper handling and disposal of plants and animals. And more specifically, we really stress that do not release message. Um, and, you know, rather than encouraging them to purchase per se um, native species. And to share this message of do not release with retailers and the public, we developed a number of printed outreach products. And these materials were created for retailers and conservation partners to display and hand out to their customers. And our materials include a brochure outlining regulated aquatic plants in Michigan, a wrap card with disposal tips that's really easy for retailers to stuff into bags or to staple receipts to. Um, we have these vinyl aquarium tank clings that are pictured on this slide that you know attach to fish tanks and can be moved around. And we also have um, towels, stickers, and paper and waterproof posters um, that uh, retailers and our partners um, enjoy greatly. And Along with these printed materials, we also have two educational videos, um, one focused on aquariums and one focused on water gardens in the handling and disposal of plants and animals. Um, and if you're interested in any of this, on any of these materials, um, please check out our website. Um, we have PDF copies of everything as well um, as links to our video. And to share the Ripple message and our materials with retailers and the public, we partner with a variety of organizations um, our main focus is independently owned retail and pet, pet and garden stores. Um, however, we also have very strong partnerships with nature centers, aquariums and zoos, um, water garden and aquarium clubs, as well, um, as well as teachers. So very similar to Habitatitude. <laughs> and our primary, our primary goal is to really share these Ripple materials with those independent retailers um, and the most effective way we found to do that is through in-store visits with um, store managers and owners. And to date, we visited over 48 retailers. And really during these meetings, we you know, share Ripple materials with them, encourage them to display them in their store, and answer any questions that we might have. Um, and I also attend events with an educational booth, um, such as like industry trade shows, 
garden stores, spring opening houses, um, aquarium fish society conferences, and zoos and aquariums. And then we also conduct trainings on invasive species regulations um, and uh, also do you know, articles and various publications. And those numbers to the right are how many we've done in the last two years. And another aspect of Ripple, um, which is similar to Habitatitude, is that we have a presence on social media, um, specifically Facebook. Uh, we frequently post relevant invasive species news stories, acknowledge our new retail partners, and we create um, shareable images that retailers and consumers and conservation groups can really share with their friends. Um, and we always encourage our retail partners to like and share our content. And so on your screen, you'll see two examples of um, graphics that we've created um, that have, you know, and circulating around on Facebook. And as I mentioned earlier, Ripple is a data-driven outreach program. And to ensure that Ripple messaging is accurately aligned with retailer knowledge and attitudes, I conducted a mail survey of independent Michigan retailers for my master's research. And prior to this study, there had not been a survey conducted of Michigan retailers about their knowledge of invasive species. And the survey included 27 questions and was mailed to 161 independent water garden and pet stores in Michigan. And I had a 42% response rate. The objectives of this study were to determine retailers' risk perception of their industry versus other known vectors of invasive species introductions, retailers' behaviors and whether or not they offered customers recommendations about proper handling and disposal, um, their sense of responsibility for sharing invasive species information with the public, um, and also to determine where they turn to for information. And lastly, if there are demographic differences between stores that would really impact their knowledge, behavior, and attitudes about invasive species. And I'd like to present some very preliminary findings from this survey. Um, this graph simply shows the number of retailers that identified potential sources of invasive species as highly to moderately risky. And as you can see, they view their industry less risky than other known sources of invasive species introduction, which shouldn't be too surprising. And as I'm, um, and when retailers were asked if it was their responsibility to communicate with customers about plant and animal releases harming the environment, 40% of retailers in Michigan felt it was somewhat are not at all their responsibility for sharing this information with the public. And as I mentioned earlier, Ripple education materials are designed for in-store display, and hobbyists have noted they believe retailers are really responsible for posting information in their stores. However, less than half of Michigan retailers um, believe, it's their believe it's completely or mostly their responsibility to share this information about unwanted plants and animals. And lastly, when retailers are asked how knowledgeable they feel about invasive species regulation, only 43% of Michigan retailers felt extremely or very, very knowledgeable about our state and federal regulations. And so it's clear, it's clear from these preliminary findings that retail engagement on invasive species needs to continue. However, through Ripple, we are raising the profile of this issue in Michigan. And with this campaign, we're also creating a network of partners that can answer questions about online species. And we're really equipping our retailers and conservation partners that um, are getting asked questions about unwanted plants and animals um, with tools to share information. Um, and I'd also like to add that while the campaign is coordinated by Michigan State, we have an advisory committee made up of retailers and state agency partners that are really offering guidance and future ideas. Um, so we're currently pursuing additional grant funding to continue the program as we are grant funded currently, um, but having that strong support of partners um, has, you know, really helped us. And we, you know, currently do not do um, surrender events, but it's definitely something that, that we look forward to learning more about from Wisconsin and Minnesota, and definitely something that we're thinking about doing in the future now that we've created such a strong network of, of Ripple um, partners. And with that, I'd like to add that if you're interested in learning more about Ripple, um, please visit our website, um, like us on Facebook, or um, feel free to send me an email or shoot me a, a chat question. 
Thank you, Paige. And and not just like uh, not just find us on Facebook, but like us on Facebook. That was <laughs> that was a nice ask. Okay. Um, and again, uh, looks like some of you are using the chat box. So uh, questions for Paige, please pop them over there in the chat, and we will get to them after our last presenter, which is Greg Hitzroth, Aquatic Invasive Species Outreach Specialist for Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. So uh, welcome, Greg. Thank you very much. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, organisms of trade outreach in Illinois and Indiana. I'd like to acknowledge my supervisor, Pat Charleboy. So if I ever say uh, we, that's usually who I'm referring to. Uh, so today I'm gonna to talk mostly about three resources that we've been developing in Illinois and Indiana. Um, so the Take AIM website, uh, Aquatic Invaders in the Marketplace, the new Invasive Greyfish Collaborative uh, for the Great Lakes region, as well as the Be Here Release Zero, um, campaign, uh, very similar to Ripple and Habitatitude, uh, but specifically uh, tailored to uh, needs in Illinois. So the aquatic invaders in the marketplace are takeaim.org. Uh, this is the homepage. There's a lot of resources on this website. It is a national focused website about organisms and trade um, and some resources uh, for outreach professionals, but also for hobbyists as well. Um, I'm going to mostly focus on some useful tools for uh, outreach specialists, um, or people interested in outreach. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is talk about uh, the state and federal regulations database that we have. Um, so this is, a again, a national uh, scoped database. Uh, you can search for prohibited species across states. Uh, so this is an example of snakehead in Illinois. Um, you can see uh, here at the top, uh, regulation search. So you can type in a common name or a scientific name. Uh, select your jurisdiction, so that could be uh, multiple states. So if you're a retailer selling in um, Indiana from Illinois, you can see which species are prohibited across state lines. Um, and then you can see if there are any exceptions to uh, these regulations for a state. Illinois has a white list as well as a prohibited species list. And so this is the exception um, here in the blue box right under the state uh, Illinois. Um, we try to update this uh, regulations database every so often. Uh, we don't have hard funding for it, so we do it as we can. Uh, right now, we have a, a new update coming probably in about a month or so. So we'll go uh, across the US and ask ANS coordinators from individual states to update their prohibited species list with us. Um, and we try to publish that as much as we can. The next uh, tool I like to point out is here at the top, the outreach resources. So this is a long list of known outreach resources across the US as well. Uh, so we have the name of the product, the type of the product, uh, who developed that product, and the geographic scope of those products. Um, the blue on the left-hand side under the name of the product is typically a link to a PDF or even a website that should have an example of those products. Um, there's no searchable function for the outreach resources. Uh, so I'd highly recommend the control F function on your keyboard um, or control find. Uh, to search for certain topics if you're interested in something specific. Uh, up here on the right-hand corner is the Notre Dame stair tool. Um, you can also get to this by the predicting invasions uh, or predict invaders uh, link here at the bottom of the page. And what this is is a list of risk assessments uh, for the U.S. as well. Uh, the Notre Dame stair tool is mostly uh, focused on the Great Lakes states. Um, so <clears throat> what they did was looked at trade uh, species and trade uh, or taxa and trade um, and looked at high risk, low risk species. Um, and then we took that information and turned into some outreach products. Uh, so on the left here is actually a one foot by three foot poster that we've been uh, distributing to retailers for probably about four years now. Um, so it's asking people what's in their water garden, um, let them know that some species can be potentially problematic. On the right-hand side, the top and the bottom, um, those are the inside and outside of a brochure. Um, it folds down to about the size of a wallet card, also distributed through retailers. Uh, the Avoid These Invaders are lists of high-risk species that were determined through the Notre Dame stair tool um, to be invasive. And the Grow These Non-Invaders are native or non-invasive species through those lists as alternatives. And we uh, worked with a few retailers to kind of refine this list um, to see what they were actually selling or potentially selling through online sources. And so this is a relatively relevant uh, list of species being sold. We also disseminated uh, or uh, distilled down the Aquatic Nation Species Task Force 
uh, water garden guidelines into some other steps for people to take under the more ways you can help on these brochures. Um, I just want to point out that even though that was the, the Notre Dame stair tool is Great Lakes based, uh, we have other risk assessments uh, housed on this website. And so this is a list of Midwest uh, risk assessments. So you can see uh, that we have multiple authors listed and then also a wide geographic scope. A lot of them um, outside the Great Lakes uh, are probably going to be federal uh, scale uh, risk assessments. And finally, for the Take Game website, I just want to point out that we have alternatives to pet release, a new website resource. Um, so we have lists of aquatic vets and a rehome network. And this rehome network is essentially organizations or businesses that are willing to be posted online that will take back unwanted pets. Um, so mostly I'm going to focus on aquatic vets because that's a more complete resource at this moment. Uh, so you click on aquatic vets, it'll bring up some lists. Uh, currently, we're, our scope is for the Great Lakes, but we can always expand this as needed. Our map is a little small. It's a graphic design issue. We plan to fix that pretty soon here. Um, and so under Illinois for the aquatic vets, um, typically what happens is you see this page then come up, uh, which divides the state of Illinois into uh, more populated parts of the state, uh, so like northwest or northeast. Um, and then we have the list of vets that are able to take care of uh, aquatic or semi-aquatic pets. Um, and then you have the name of the veterinarian, the address, the phone number, um, and what they can care for. And these were confirmed by calling each individual practice. Um, and then we also link to their website on the hyperlink there. Uh, moving on to the Invasive Crayfish Collaborative, I'm going to just touch on this really quickly. Uh, this is funded through the Great Lakes Rest Rest Restoration Initiative, and this is an attempt to bring people interested in invasive crayfish um, across the Great Lakes states together to talk about uh, invasive crayfish issues. Um, so one thing that we want to do is create a clearinghouse of information for people interested in invasive crayfish. So big background biology and crayfish, uh, prevention of new crayfish populations, and management of those population options. Uh, eventually, we'd like this collaborative to help drive research priorities. Um, and we're going to do this through recruiting individual people, um, such as researchers, managers, uh, industry representatives. Um, we're going to host events. We had our first one about two weeks ago in Chicago. Uh, and then ultimately, we're going to start producing some uh, documentation of the, uh, the goals of the collaborative and possibly even some outreach products uh, aimed more at uh, retailers or hobbyists. It really depends on what um, uh, the collaborative is interested in doing. And finally, I want to talk about the uh, Illinois um, Organism Trade Prevention Program. Uh, so the Be Hero Releaso campaign is part of the overall arching uh, invasive species campaign in Illinois, the Be a Hero campaign. So we have Be Hero Transport Zero for aquatics and terrestrial species, and that's more focused on recreational users of boats or even trails and campsites. Um, we paired it up with the Be Hero Release Zero to uh, increase our impacts across branding. Um, and so Be Hero Release Zero, uh, very similar to how Tattooed and Ripple, uh, asked people to uh, bag and place their plants in the trash, uh, find a new owner or advice on inhumane disposal of animals, uh, dispose of uh, water uh, either through disinfecting or repurposing it. Um, we are trying to get people to take a pledge uh, to prevent the spread of invasive species through our website and through trade shows. Uh, we have report new sightings. So this is a link to USGS's NAS database. Um, we try to break down Illinois laws uh, for purchasers and um, consumers of aquatic species in Illinois so they can know uh, what laws uh, apply to them. Uh, we're trying to create a more targeted mailing list of organizations or people who are interested in this. Often, we find social media, uh, we talk to the choir um, uh, just because of who follows us. Um, and then resources, again, this is linking back to Take Aim. Uh, we're asking people to become partners. Uh, so this is within the state of Illinois, but we also have had some partners outside of the state of Illinois um, interested in uh, Be a Hero campaign materials. And some of the campaign materials that we've developed so far include things such as uh, displays for trade shows, which have environmental impacts, uh, the Be Hero messaging, as well as uh, purchasing uh, uh, su suggestions based, again, uh, from that Notre Dame Stair tool. 
We've, uh, again, put this into retail situations by creating posters. Uh, we also have this uh, promotional item, which is a tank thermometer, which is pretty popular at trade shows. Uh, but we also give them to retailers to distribute to their customers as well. And those are pretty popular. And we are starting to look at advertising the rehoming and aquatic vet network. Again, I mentioned on Take Aim, and we're going to add that to our Be Hero website as well. Uh, much like Minnesota and Wisconsin, we have hosted a few pet take back uh, events, uh, Be Hero Release Zero pet take back events. We hosted three in late summer, um, early fall 2017, uh, mostly in the Chicagoland area. Uh, we received about 51 different organisms. Uh, this is Vince on the bottom left hand. He's a goldfish. Uh, he's well loved and well cared for uh, and return, uh, returned into us. Um, our partner, the Aquarium Fish Sanctuary here in Chicago, was able to rehome Vince, um, I believe, at a uh, elementary school um, science center, learning center. Um, and we also got a bunch of mystery snails as well. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, I'd like to thank our uh, funding agencies, uh, Illinois Department of Natural Resources, and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative for funding a lot of this work and acknowledge our partners um, throughout this process. Great. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, amazing list of partners in all three programs. Uh, now, um, on to questions. And uh, 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 all of you should see that uh, Tim had the additional uh, Great Lakes Biotics sessions uh, there in the chat box as well. So our, our first question uh, is from Bob. He uh, talked about the uh, Paige's comment about the attractiveness of localized programs, um, in this case, Michigan and uh, Illinois, Indiana as well. Uh, and he's wondering if the Habitat uh, if Habitatitude is aware of this preference and if they are in a position to accommodate by allowing, quote, localization of the national program. And maybe you could all speak also more broadly to this issue of, uh, you know, sharing resources and, um, you know, not not reinventing the wheel uh, and ver versus or and uh, localization as an issue in terms of how we deal with AIS uh, issues. So any, anyone can start uh, taking that question. Um, for Illinois, the Be Here Release Zero campaign uh, really works well, especially in the context of the broader statewide campaign. Um, really gave us a lot of flexibility in what we we're able to do with the, the campaign in the state of Illinois. Um, and so it's been very, uh, very effective for us to have our own state campaign. If I would chime in with. The, the Habitatitude campaign um, that it isn't necessarily not adaptable to a, a local campaign. I, I would, I guess, equate it to or a lot like the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign. It's a national brand and campaign, but a lot of different states use the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers logo with slightly different messaging on it, and so it's adaptable to states all over the country. Habitatitude is really the same thing. There's no reason why. Uh, you couldn't adapt it to more of a local campaign um, with more localized mes messaging with state or, you know, city even specific messaging. So you can do that. Um, just, I guess it would depend on uh, what your partners uh, would like to see. And I think something we can do is with some of the more local campaigns that maybe uh, tweak their branding a little bit, there's always co-branding that we can do to make sure that um, kind of these larger regional scales that, um, with both of the brands being present, we're reaching, you know, all of the people that either one of them resonates with. Yeah, this is really on uh, what Todd uh, um, just wanted to echo that both uh, South Aquatic Hitchhikers and Habitat uh, from the very beginning were intended to be uh, adaptable at the at the state um, or at the watershed level. And so that was that was the original attempt. But we also recognize that there are um, issues at the state level that um, um, people that are in agencies that are um, have have authority and jurisdiction over um, the use of of, uh, of plants and animals, organisms and trade, as well as uh, jurisdictions that have authorization over uh, transport of uh, aquatic invasive species may want to integrate in um, different messages uh, concerning their rules and regulations. And so, uh, 
but cold branding within either of the campaigns is definitely encouraged where there is a state uh, campaign. And as Tim emphasized there too, is that we see the, the uh, Be a Hero, I'll Be Lisa Hero, um, as, as well as the Ripple campaigns having very, uh, very similar messages. And so the messages are, are, are pretty congruent with the Habitat and Community Top Quality Contrarious campaigns. Okay, great. Thank, thank you all for that. And uh, Jenna has a question for Tim uh, and maybe others that are doing uh, rehoming work. What do you do with the animals that are handed over at surrender, uh, surrender events that are not rehomed? So good question. Comes up a lot. Uh, there's a lot of different formats for our pet surrender events. The ones that are aquarium clubs uh, sponsor, a lot of times the, the fish are rehomed. Uh, right away at the event. Um, ours are in association with a, a twice a year auction that's a fundraiser for the Green Bay Aquarium Society. So I, in those instances, I don't think any fish have not gone home uh, right after the event. Um, Doug or Greg can chime in with some of their events, but then uh, some of the other events too that we have hosted uh, with our other partners, Kingdom Animalia, Exotic Animal Rescues, Eat the Snake Guy. Um, each one of those nonprofits is committed to taking um, those pet surrendered pets back with them to their facilities and caring for them uh, until they can be rehomed. And so in some of them, uh, we don't even rehome them right away. We take them back uh, with our nonprofits. They evaluate them, make sure they don't need any veterinary care before they put them into kind of their network of people interested in rehoming those pets. So yeah, I would just really stress the partnerships and that uh, if you are looking to put on an event, um, before you host the event, get a commitment from all of your partners to make sure they have the capacity to care for them. We even go as far as you know having the events places that have the capacity to care for any extra animals that for some reason we're so successful <laughs> we can't care for uh, everything that we get to come in. Uh, here in Minnesota, too, um, I believe that every single animal. Doug, Doug, I'm gonna, Doug, I'm gonna stop you for a minute. Just ask you to speak directly into your mic. We're getting a little, little bit garbled occasionally. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, see, I just wanted to say that, uh, building upon what Tim had said, is that um, I believe that all of the animals that uh, we have received here in Minnesota have either been resold or rehomed, and it all depends upon the uh, partners that we have involved. For example, again, in the Twin Cities, we have the Minnesota Aquarium Society, where we partnered with their winter as well as their spring auctions. And so they use that, uh, they're a 501c3, they use that as a, as a, a benefit um, to, their, to their program as a revenue generator. And everybody wins in that situation because um, the people that are bringing in animals, of course, uh, get to rehome them, uh, know that they're gonna be well taken care of. The, uh, the um, Minnesota Aquarium Society wins because they're able to um, uh, resell them uh, through their auction. And of course, it's been a win for the Habitattitude campaign uh, because we're able to uh, raise awareness uh, via their events. Uh, so that's worked out very well. Here in the Duluth area, uh, we have a little bit different situation because we do have a pet retailer, uh, World of Fish, uh, that deals with both fish, aquatic plants, and also reptiles. And so they're able to take them back. Um, if they are large um, fish, for example, um, they also have contracts with dentist offices, uh, uh, doctor's offices, and restaurants where they may be able to place those uh, those those uh, those fish if possible. Otherwise, they they can be also resold um, at their point of business. Okay, great. Uh, hey. no? go, go ahead. So oh, for Illinois, uh, it's very similar to what Tim was discussing. Um, we made sure that the nonprofit that we worked with uh, for these events had the capacity to rehome or at least house um, the organism until they're able to find a forever home for it. So that was a that was a lot of work on our part to like make sure that he had the capacity to do that before we hosted these events. Great, thanks, Greg. And uh, Hunter asks, is there more of a public understanding of aquatic invasive animals versus plants? And how do you guys tackle maybe that um, different, uh, different understanding of plants versus animals?
I'm not sure if I can comment specifically on that question, although I do know that I think Ruben Keller recently presented a survey, I think at the Invasive Crayfish Collaborative, on just uh, in Illinois people's different awareness levels of invasive species and how they differed across the species. Um, what I can say, you know, specific to this organisms and trade presentation, I think there is a difference in understanding uh, between some of the pathways of invasive species and what can be invasive. Uh, we've done such a good job of messaging uh, that, you know, recreational boating can move invasive species. So people think of zebra mussels or Eurasian water milfoil and things that can be moved by boats. Um, but a lot of times when we're talking to hobbyists, I think there's a little bit of a disconnect that, you know, this hobby that they engage in that has nothing to do with boats and moving around the lakes could uh, potentially be a pathway of invasive species. And then especially that release behavior, um, there's, a, again, a disconnect. They think they're doing something really good for the animal, and it doesn't really connect that they're doing something uh, that's maybe not so great for the environment. Um, so I think it's just having good examples and uh, good comments that resonate uh, with folks. I always reference, uh, uh, geez, <laughs> uh, the Everglades in Florida and what's happening there. Uh, with some of the OIT invasive species that pop up, and that really seems to resonate with people. Um, so sorry, Hunter, that I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> uh, but at least with OIT, I think there's a lot of disconnect between kind of the activity and the fact that it could be early to invasive species. I'm going to go ahead. This is Rebecca. I'm going to go ahead and move on to um, uh, a question that I wrote down, and, and that is, uh, and Paige and others may have, uh, some response to this, but uh, given the it, the data that you collected related to retailers, I'm wondering how you how you open the conversation with store managers and staff. You know, so when you do those store visits and you go there for the first time, some of them may not feel like this is really you know their their thing or that they have much responsibility for it. So how how do you start those conversations? Yeah, um, that's a a really great question. So. Um, really the, the first thing that, um, the first thing that I do is, you know, I usually give them a call on the phone and just say, Hey, I'm in your neck of the woods. And I think what helps me greatly is, um, that I'm a, I'm a student and I am from a Michigan state and so they don't see me as threatening. Um, I used to say that I coordinate a campaign, a state invasive species campaign, and I would immediately kind of get brushed off. But, um, now I kind of say it's a Michigan State program and people love extension in our state, which I think helps us a lot. Um, and, you know, I also, when I go into stores, especially I don't always call, sometimes I just show up, um, all of our stuff is free. And so um, that's really helped me just saying like, hey, can you just like slap up this poster? You know, it won't take any of your time. Um, and oftentimes, you know, I've, I've really, you know, of the, around 50 store visits I've done, um, I've only ever been turned down once and he still took my poster. So, um, you know, I've had really, just really positive interactions. Also the creation of Ripple was um, included a very, very well-known pet store in Lansing, um, who knows absolutely every other pet store in Michigan and a lot of garden stores. And so when I say like, hey, Rick told me to stop by he really recommended you. Um, name dropping has greatly assisted me um, in getting in a lot of stores. Um, so that's helped. And then also I partner, you know, really closely with aquarium and garden clubs. And oftentimes I'll say like, oh, I was presenting at this garden club last week. They shop at your store a lot. They really recommended I talk to you. And then store owners just tend to listen because they know I somebody referred them. So yeah, I, I've had... While my survey indicates, you know, stores don't think it's a responsibility to really share this information, um, they seem very willing when I'm in front of them to share information. Great tips, thanks. And uh, Tim, Doug, or Greg, anything else? I guess I would chime in. That, uh, oh. In base is a lot easier to get people to participate. Um, I have called many retailers and have been brushed off very easily through the tel telephone, but it's a lot different than standing in front of them. Um, presenting with uh, materials and talking about why we're doing what we're doing. 
So I would, I would echo that. I'm just showing up sometimes. But yeah, kind of had to make sure that you're going to get to the right people. Um, definitely will save you some time. And to add on to what Greg and Paige had to say, I always like to let, you know, especially industry folks know that, you know, I'm on their team. Like when we're working with the boating industry, I want to keep people boating and doing what they do. And, you know, for the pet industry, I want people to be successful owning pets. I want your business to be successful. And I think that, you know, these outreach efforts are one way that, you know, we can help you be successful and help you have less issues with your business in the future. So, you know, kind of that approach has helped me a lot, not just with IT, but uh, some other outreach efforts as well. Great. Okay. Um, any other questions from our participants? Last chance. Okay. Um, well, we want to thank everyone, uh, thanking our presenters. Thank you so much for that excellent uh, information and lots, you, you packed lots into a short period of time. So uh, it'll be great for people to be able to go back to some of that information and also a number of the resources that you shared. Um, thank you to all of you who, who joined us today. Please uh, go back to our website, northcentralwater.org to access the webinar archive or um, of this webinar and the other webinars that we have there. Uh, just want to plug a couple of upcoming sessions for us. August 8th, uh, harmful algal blooms, uh, which in some cases can be related in some ways to aquatic invasives. Um, so please uh, check that session out. And then uh, we're also, we have a, a session coming up, our, our North Central uh, Climate Team, NC3, uh, webinar on August 27th at 1 p.m. Uh, Central Time, the impact of wind energy on rural communities. And again, you can uh, register at our website, North Central, or register at their website, uh, northcentralclimate.org. Thank you so much and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon. <laughs>